was actually a year ago this month when we were all together at this dinner, and the Dobbs decision had just been leaked. And there were three words on my mind that night. How dare they? How dare they attack our health care system? How dare they attack our fundamental rights? How dare they attack the freedom of the women of America to make decisions about their own bodies? That was the vice president speaking in Washington tonight. This week, Planned Parenthood issued a statement saying, as we continue to face unrelenting attacks on our basic freedoms, our courts must be one backstop to protecting our rights. Instead, the courts have been used as a vehicle to advance a dangerous agenda against abortion rights, voting rights, LGBTQ plus rights, and so much more. Planned Parenthood now supports expanding the number of Supreme Court justices implementing term limits for Supreme Court justices and imposing ethics rules on members of the Supreme Court. Its support for those reforms come as more states pass legislation banning abortion in the aftermath of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. After North Carolina's Democratic Governor Roy Cooper vetoed legislation on Saturday that would have banned all abortions in his state after 12 weeks of pregnancy. Today, North Carolina's Republican-controlled legislature voted to override the governor's veto, making that abortion ban law. Joining us now is Alexis McGill-Johnson, president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Federation of America and the Planned Parenthood Action Fund. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, first of all, I want to get your reaction to one day of seeming success uh, in North Carolina with that veto and now the setback of the veto being overridden. Well, thanks, Lawrence. Look, I was in North Carolina on Saturday with the governor and with hundreds of people out uh, on a Mother's Day weekend uh, screaming and yelling um, in support of his veto because they were screaming and yelling in support of their own freedom. And to see that um, that vote, uh, that veto be overridden uh, today, I think is just emblematic of how much of a crisis our democracy is in. The great majority of people in North Carolina support reproductive freedom, and there is no accountability for Democratic legislator, or, uh, legislators in, um, in uh, the State House uh, because they've been gerrymandered into their positions and now, in fact, can uh, represent their own ideas as opposed to uh, as opposed to what their constituents believe. And I think that is exactly why we are, you know, leaning into the need for not just democracy reform writ large, but court reform as well as a critical component of that. So uh, the Constitution does not establish a number of Supreme Court justices. Uh, Congress has done that. It has raised the number. It has lowered the number, raised it again. Uh, it's set at nine since, I believe, 1869. The country has uh, more than tripled in size since then in terms of population. It has more than tripled uh, in terms of complexity. And American law has more than tripled in complexity. And yet it's still just the nine uh, deciding all of those issues that come to the court. Uh, how did you come to the conclusion that the court should be expanded? Well, we also know that uh, justices are living a lot longer uh, than their original uh, lifetime uh, span uh, during their lifetime appointments. And so, you know, we came to this uh, uh, position because we f fundamentally understand that the courts should protect our rights, right? The courts should be the ones that are adjudicating whether or not our fundamental rights exist. And we have watched lower courts all the way up through the Supreme Court be weaponized to erode and, and literally out, outright revoke our rights um, in, in unbelievably unprecedented ways. And so, you know, look, we have lots of uh, partners in this movement who've been calling for court reform. We have been very clear that uh, this uh, overturn of, of um, Roe v. Wade and the Dobbs decision uh, was just the canary in the coal mine um, in terms of the, the kinds of rights that that will be taken away in future courts. And we just think it's incredibly 
critical in this moment for us and for Americans to understand the full complexity of American democracy and how it is in crisis in this moment when fundamental freedoms are being taken away. Uh, since I read this, I've been very eager to talk to you about it because I hadn't noticed this. I hadn't noticed what has happened to the word freedom and its meaning uh, and how it changes, whether it's used by uh, Joe Biden, as we saw it there, and uh, Republican officials now. Uh, describe what you see here as the opportunity for President Biden. Well, you know, Lawrence, you and I are both language people. And, you know, in politics is about policies and it's about ideas and it's about stupid fights. But at some deep level, it's about language. It's about leaders offering different options to people in the form of language and people choosing which of those languages resonates with where they are. And I, as a language person, pay a lot of attention to what the shifting language is. And one thing I noticed, uh, two things I, I noticed, I would say, first of all, uh, in my entire lifetime, uh, the Republican Party has gone very long on the language of freedom. And Ronald Reagan in particular, I think, started that phenomenon of freedom, freedom, freedom. If you, when in doubt, if you don't know what to say, say freedom. Uh, everything is kind of laundered through a frame of freedom. Uh, you know, fomenting tyranny in Latin America is called freedom. Every, you know, busting unions is called freedom. Uh, but the Republicans did a very smart, tactical job of rebranding every single striving of theirs, including things that made people's lives harder, more precarious, and less free, as freedom. And I think in many ways, the political left, Democrats in particular, over the last generation, kind of passively accepted this as, OK, this is the reality. You're the freedom people, so we'll do justice. We'll do solidarity. We'll do equality. We'll do the future. We'll do hope. We'll do stronger together. We, we have all these other frames, but we'll, we'll kind of leave you this freedom territory. I think this is a catastrophic mistake, as I write about in the ink. And what is so interesting is that before Joe Biden came along and made that, made that ad, Donald Trump is the bridge uh, where freedom kind of flew off into the water because in his uh, American Carnage inaugural speech, interestingly, he mentioned it one time in a kind of boilerplate thing. But more importantly, under the Trump kind of view of the world, freedom is not a particularly important animating value. Uh, and what I write about in the ink is that the Reaganite idea of freedom was you are powerful as individuals. You have bubbling, fizzing potential as Americans. And if we could just let you alone, you would be free and thrive. By the time we move from the libertarian Republican Party to the authoritarian one of today, the pitch has changed. The view of human nature has changed. The view now is you are weak and vulnerable and can't do anything on your own because these powerful forces are out to get you. And only I, Donald Trump, only I, Ron DeSantis, can protect you. And so the, the right is not really about strong, powerful individuals needing to be set free anymore. And this creates space for Joe Biden, for the Democrats, for the left in general to enter that terrain of freedom that they wrongfully deserted and make, as your last guest was talking about, make abortion as it is a referendum on the freedom over one's body. Make, you know, the, the fights over spending right now. A uh, would, would you have the freedom to thrive with a modern safety net? Do you have the freedom to get the education you need? Do you have the freedom to be able to have support when life knocks you down? Uh, this question of freedom is now front and center back in American politics. And Joe Biden has done a very smart thing by ending this silly concession of freedom to the right and stepping in to claim it. You know, I, I think in the audience, minds are racing as mine are uh, with applying this concept uh, to our politics now. For example, the freedom to read uh, when you're going to high school in Florida, uh, the, all of these things, it, it's just everywhere in these political dynamics. It's everywhere and it's not made up. I mean, I, yeah. I got to say, you and I are both having this conversation because we had the freedom to read growing up. I don't think I would be capable of having this conversation with you if I had not had the freedom to read. I have traveled to many countries, as I'm sure you have, where people did not have the same freedom mm -hmm. to read 
that I did. And I'm very aware that I'm able to have this conversation with you because I did have that freedom. So yeah, that's a pretty important freedom. You know, they talk about the, 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 the freedom to, you know, have reproductive rights and reproductive justice. I mean, that's, it, it's, it's about control over your body. And it's also about the freedom to frankly, like go out on a Friday night and not be afraid you are making a lifelong decision if you meet someone at the bar. You know, uh, Amanda uh, uh, Marcotte wrote this great piece uh, a few months ago about the Democratic Party and strategy saying, look, if, if we as Democrats cannot make the case to people that we are the party trying to, you know, have you curl up, have the freedom to curl up with a good book and get laid without fear, we don't deserve to win. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it, to be very serious about it, all of these fights are fights for freedom. And often they are reframed in these like wonky policy terms by mm -hmm. by folks on the left. And we have to go guttural and we have to remember people don't understand what Medicare for all means, except people who really focus on this issue. But they know what it means to be free. They know what it means to be free from their boss deciding what kind of health care they have. And so speaking to people in, in that kind of physiological language of freedom is incredibly important. We have been uh, discussing discharge petitions on this program a few times. Uh, it's complicated, and I have to review it a little bit for the audience each time. Uh, it's a petition that requires the signatures of a majority of members of the House, and those signatures then force a vote uh, on the bill uh, in the House of Representatives. And so uh, Hakeem Jeffries, uh, Leader Jeffries, uh, was in the meeting today in the Oval Office. Uh, the possibility of moving, beginning to try to move a discharge position, begins tomorrow, according to the parliamentary rules. Has there been a decision uh, by Leader Jeffries uh, and you and others about how to proceed on a discharge petition? Well, thank you very much for having me, uh, Lawrence. I don't think so. Uh, I had dinner uh, and a meeting with uh, Leader Jeffries last night. Uh, he is very much uh, in touch with our caucus. Uh, a few minutes ago, uh, I interacted. Uh, with our whip, uh, and they are discussing how best to go forward. As you know, uh, he will make that decision. Uh, he will be relying upon his team, uh, like his whipping operation, uh, to make sure that we got the 213 Democrats. Uh, and then we'll be hopeful uh, as to whether or not we can pick up five uh, Republicans to come along. So I don't know that they've made a final decision on that, uh, but— uh, uh, I hope uh, that he will let us know tomorrow uh, and we can start the process just in case it is something that is needed. I'm sure, uh, like everybody else, he would like to see us do this uh, using what we call a regular order and not uh, go to a discharge petition, uh, but uh, that should be on the table just in case we need to. Yeah, I mean, he he has presented it as an option. And as you say, uh, you could start collecting those signatures tomorrow and it would just be a way, theoretically, of adding some pressure to getting to a final agreement that people can vote through. Uh, one of the things that I think might be confusing people a little bit is President Biden saying he wasn't going to negotiate on the debt ceiling. And what I seem to be hearing the White House say is we're not negotiating on the debt ceiling. Uh, we still want to have a clean debt ceiling bill, but we are negotiating on the budget of the United States of America going forward, and we're trying to reach some agreements that we're going to have to reach with a Republican House uh, on the budget. Uh, and because those two discussions are happening at the same time, uh, a it, it looks like it's negotiating on the debt ceiling, but the White House is insisting, so far anyway, that these are actually separate procedures? I think they are. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I've advocated for some time now, I think when I was on your show the last time, uh, that we uh, look at, uh, because this is coming a little quicker than we thought. Uh, we started out the year thinking it will be sometimes in August or September before we reach uh, that uh, debt ceiling. 
but it looks like it's going to be June 1st. So I've advocated that we should do a clean, short-term CR, uh, I mean, not sorry, uh, debt limit bill uh, to expire uh, maybe September 30th, which is the same date uh, that the fiscal year will expire, and let those two negotiations go simultaneously on two different parallel uh, courses. And so you have uh, the debt limit uh, being discussed and negotiated at the same time that we are negotiating uh, spending for the next fiscal year. There will be separate bills but uh, and on different uh, tracks, uh, but running parallel. Uh, you know, as you know, in the history of uh, debt ceiling increases in the Congress, most of the time it was done without even provoking a headline. It was done uh, often unanimously in the Senate, uh, just without any controversy whatsoever. But now you have Republican members of the House of Representatives who are saying, well, you know, let's just crash right through the debt ceiling. Uh, what difference does it make? Well, I'm not sure that it makes any difference. I don't know how you go about doing that. It'll be uh, wind up in the coast, I'm sure. But how many other countries got this kind of a, a debt ceiling? We, we, I think we're the only one left. Mm -hmm. This is not the way to do things in this day and time. I think we have a ceiling on expenditures every time you adopt a budget. And you have a debt uh, when you go over that budget. And you're a deficit uh, when you are spending more uh, than you're taking in. So I don't know that we need this debt limit stuff. Uh, it doesn't do anything for any other country. Why do we have it? I've advocated ever since I've been in the Congress for getting rid of that. 